Hello, chess fans. I'm Sam Copeland, and I'm a national master on the content team at chess.com, and I'm here today to present the first tiebreak game between Grandmasters Vidit Gujarati and Ali Reza Faruja from the Prague International Chess Festival. Now, previously in the tournament, Vidit was running away with it, and it seemed like in round eight he would clinch victory against David Navarra, but disaster befell him. You can check out analysis of that game right over here. In the final round, he also lost to Jan Christoph Duda, and that permitted a five-way tie for first place. Per the rules of the tournament, there would be two tiebreak games, five minutes plus three-second increment games, played to determine the title of tournament winner between the two players with the best tiebreaks. That was Grandmaster Vidit and Grandmaster Faruja, and this is the first of those two tiebreak games. Vidit drew the white pieces and he opened up the game with pawn d4. Faruja responded naturally with the queen's gambit decline setup. Vidit now played the Catalan here, preparing to fianchetto his bishop, and then Faruja played this little finesse here, so he's inducing the move bishop d2, he gets it, and then he says, hmm, your bishop is misplaced on d2, and I will pull back now to e7. Of course, this is all very theoretical. There are many games in this line, including games among the greatest players in chess history. Both players continue naturally, and it's really only here on move 11 coming up that we get a new wrinkle. That is the move queen to c7 from Faruja. Instead, a little more natural is the immediate pawn c5 or rook c8 to prepare c5, but of course queen c7 is no big blunder. Maybe, maybe it's a small inaccuracy. So now we get rook d1, that is officially a novelty, pawn c5, rook c1, and then a trade on c4, and it is at this point in the game that Faruja says, it's time to mix things up. He is a consistently dynamic player, he certainly was in these tiebreak games, and he also seems to be a player who really likes concrete play, so he's often going to play an attacking move, making immediate threats. In this case, that move is b5 here. Now, b5 uh, raises an eyebrow. It seems a little bit suspect. It is extending the pawns here, but it's also trying to take advantage of an awkward lineup of four of white's pieces here on the c-file. Vidit immediately responds by trying to untangle these pieces a bit, bishop a5 hitting the queen, which falls back, and the knight hops into e5, and there's an exchange on e5, and then the pawn captures back. Now, at this point, Vidit can feel like he should have some advantage. He's got a really nice uh, set of strong, heavy pieces in the middle of the board, and the e5 pawn, which could become weak, also can be used to create an attack here on the king side, which is what Vidit is hoping it will be able to do. So Vidit is really hoping that uh, he can press forward on the king side directly long before this e5 pawn becomes weak. The knight hops into d5 from Faruja, and the bishop immediately reroutes to point to the king side, and Vidit is thinking about sticking something into g5 as a way to initiate that attack. In response, Faruja plays h6, saying, I'm going to keep things out of g5. And then in response to that, Vidit says, it's time to strike out. He plays the move pawn to g4. Very, very aggressive. This move is really uh, only plausible because of h6 here. Without this hook, there would be no target for white to expand with the pawns and open lines. There would be no lines to really open if the pawn were back and there were no hook to induce pawn exchanges. Now, g4 is probably a little bit suspicious, but on the other hand, Vidit has the white pieces in this game. There are two tiebreak games. When you're playing the white pieces in a tiebreak, you really feel pressure to create opportunities to actually get winning chances because if you don't, then you're going to have to defend in the next game. So we get this aggressive advance here, and then Faruja swings his queen over to defend the king side. We get pawn h4, intending to push forward with that g5 break. And at this point, Faruja didn't need to respond aggressively on the king side, although it's certainly exciting for us as viewers that he did. He could have just played a move like rook c8 right here and had a very nice position. There's no need for any big confrontation yet, but he goes for that confrontation. He plays the move pawn to f5. So this move is really saying who is attacking who on the king side. Vidit with the moves g4 and h4 has said, I am attacking you. I'm going to open up lines, push forward with g5, and I'm going to press the king side. This move 
F5 from Ferugia says, actually, it's the other way around. I'm going to use my rook on the F file. I'm going to get my queen in there. Look at all of these other pieces that have access to the king side here. In this case, Ferugia ends up being the one who manages to create more attacking chances on the king side, trying to expose the squares weakened here by the advance of the pawns. But if in this position, after e takes f6, knight takes f6, Vidit had played knight e5, not the move that he played, it should have been Vidit who was really creating more chances. The knight would have been amazing here on e5. It would defend this g4 pawn that was attacked by the knight that just recaptured on f6. And the knight is targeting this g6 square as well. It is helped in that um, attack by the queen on c2, also helping to control g6. And this is a really nice position for white. It is quite a significant advantage. Not winning, but a significant advantage. You really feel that the light squares over here are very vulnerable, and it's hard to imagine how Ferugia can really create an attack on the king side. Instead, Vidit pushed forward right away with pawn to g5 here, and then earlier we saw the move bishop to a5 tickling the black queen while our knight was under attack. In this case, it's Ferugia who has a knight under attack, and he strikes out with a bishop attack, uh, a tickling of the white queen in response. Kind of an interesting little symmetry there. After bishop e4, the queen selects the b2 square, and then we get knight g4, and now we're starting to feel like Ferugia can possibly create some chances here on the king side. Of course, in the meantime, Vidit is trying to create chances in the center of the board, leading to the black king. He plays bishop here, creating a battery immediately attacking g7, and also opening up this rook to infiltrate on the d file. We get queen g6 in response from Ferugia here, which uh, lines up here on the g-pawn and the g-file where the king is, and it defends g7. Rook to d7 from Vidit. Obviously, the rook looks great here, although... As we know, Vidit has not had the best luck recently with rooks on the seventh rank. Rook f7 is a nice defensive move in response, defending e7 and g7. And now we get queen d2. Vidit is really going to be playing a very centralized strategy with his heavy pieces from here on out. H takes g5, and after H takes g5, a mistake from Vidit, who should have taken on e7, an idea we'll see in a moment, right away, uh, here uh, Ferugia missed a knockout blow. This is actually a great moment to pause your video and try to figure out what black should have played. The winning line is actually bishop takes f3. Makes total sense. You eliminate the defender of g5, and when you eliminate that defender, you get to capture with the bishop on g5, and when you capture with the bishop, you have made a skewer. You are picking up an exchange and you should win the game very, very quickly soon after that. You're also attacking d7, which is a nice bonus as well. So this is a fine winning continuation for black. Of course, around this point in the game, it's worth noting that Vidit had about 10 seconds left of his initial five minutes, so he is bashing his moves out constantly. And Ferugia has about a minute, but he is trying to keep the time pressure on Vidit, so he is also playing very quickly. He plays queen h5 right away, missing the opportunity to take on f3 and then g5. And he's obviously lining up for some attacks down here. If he can eliminate f3, then he may be able to get his queen into h2 with check and make some very deadly threats. So in response, Vid decides correctly that it is time to sacrifice to create counterplay. He plays rook takes e7. He gives up an exchange, and after rook takes e7, his queen gets to become a monster here on d6. The queen is both a monster in attack, attacking these weak pawns, and in defense, covering this h2 square. So there's no uh, very, very dangerous queen h2 check from black for a little while. In response, Ferugia pulls his rook back to f7, which is a bit of a mistake. He could have defended that rook on uh, e7 so that... Vidit could not have captured the e6 pawn, which he does. Obviously, the queen is very happy to pick this off, and the queen is immediately attacking this e4 bishop. So that bishop pulls back to f5, and Vidit goes over queen to c6, attacking all of these wonderful, juicy little bits in the black camp. Rook c8, moving the rook and attacking the queen. And Vidit basically immediately responded here with queen to d5. There was nothing wrong with capturing 
this pawn on b5, but Vidit had like one second on the clock and he uh, played queen to d5 without calculating b5 at all because honestly, why would you? I think practically the right decision is just to stay centralized and hope for a counter chance. As it turns out, he is about to get that counter chance. Rook to e8 here attacking e2 and queen c6 again attacking e8 and these weak pawns here, but also getting out of the way so that after rook takes e2, this rook can go to d1 here. And now both the rook and the queen are creating some dangerous um, ideas of counterplay against the black king. In fact, this is a very, very critical moment in the game. In this position, correct was rook to f8. Now, I basically think there's no way that a sane chess player plays rook to f8 here with, you know, 10, 15 seconds on their clock. In this position, you can check out the analysis in the news report here, but rook d7 actually offering a second exchange sacrifice seems to be best. And in this crazy complicated position, there looks to be enough counterplay for white to hold the balance. I'm not going to go deep into that, but that's some insight from Stockfish. Instead, after rook to d1 here, instead of covering the back rank, Ferruja played rook takes f2. Now this looks really, really scary here. There are tremendous ideas to mate this white king here with the assortment of black pieces that you've built up on the king side but it is Vidit's move in this position. He starts out correctly with rook check here, but after king h7, this is a great moment to pause your video and pick the best continuation for Vidit here. Unfortunately, if you did pause your video, or even if you didn't, you had more time than Vidit had in this position because again, he basically had to bash out his move right away. He picked the move queen to e8, and this is a big mistake, unfortunately. Better was queen to a8. It's all about the order of your major pieces on the back rank. With the queen in back, you're threatening rook to h8 check, winning the black queen over here. Of course, if the queen checks and the king goes to g6, it's just a trade of queens, not a win of the queen. Also, if king g6, the only way to get out of the skewer, still rook h8 traps the queen on h5. It's a very, very direct idea, and it would have been totally winning for Vidit, even with one second on his clock, uh, had he found queen a8 instead of queen e8. So, unfortunately, queen e8 was played here, and immediately Ferruja says, I gotta get counterplay. Rook takes f3 here, eliminating the knight, so there are now possible checks. And after queen check, king up here, uh, queen takes h5 here, king takes h5, bishop takes, king takes g5. We've had a whole bunch of fireworks that have led us to an end game where Ferruja is two pawns up, but it's still one where white should be able to hold the balance. Honestly, what matters more than being down two pawns is being down on the clock here. In this position, white's bishop pair and also the fact that it's white to move and there's opportunities like rook d5, which is played to go after the pawns, mean that white has good chances to draw. King f4 tickles the bishop, and best here was actually keeping the bishop pair on the board and keeping the pressure on the pawns. Instead, after bishop takes g4, you win one pawn back right away, and you're like, hey, opposite colored bishops, no worries, easy draw. But this is not necessarily an easy draw. There are definite chances here for Ferruja to create mating nets and lots and lots of threats against this trapped white king on g1. It should be a draw. I don't want to confuse that issue. It should be a draw, but it is not an easy one. Bishop d3 defends b5 here. Bishop d2, king f3, and then the bishop falls back to e4 after rook e5. You can already sense possible mating nets here if the black pieces get into position, but with no time on the clock, Vidit played rook takes b5 right away, and unfortunately, that is the losing move. There is a mating net, rook to d8, pinning this bishop to the d1 square. Rather than just lose the bishop, we played bishop b4, Vidit played bishop b4, rook d1 check, king h2, and king g4. And this is a beautiful final position here with very few pieces left on the board, with material equality restored in the game, there is no stopping rook h1 short of giving up 
you know, uh, the rook or something like that. And so Vidit did resign in this position. In the second tiebreak game, uh, Vidit was pressing with the black pieces for a while, but ultimately Ferrugia was equalizing right near the end of the game, and Vidit ended up flagging in a position where, of course, it didn't really matter because he had to win the game. That did, sadly, though, mean that he lost his last four games in the tournament, two classicals and two tiebreak games. But on a more optimistic note, this was Ferrugia's first Super tournament win if we're counting a super tournament as a round robin with lots of 2,700 plus players. Uh, that's particularly impressive when you consider that a couple of weeks ago he didn't know he was going to play in this event. He was a last minute replacement for Wei Yi who had to withdraw because of the coronavirus making travel difficult from China. Anyway, tremendous congratulations to Ferruja. I know. Everyone in the chess world is excited for what's coming next from him, and this game illustrates exactly why. It's a wonderful example of the kind of dynamic and exciting and aggressive play that he likes to pursue. If you want to check out his win against Duda, you can click right over there on top of the chessboard for that game, also played in this tournament, and have a fantastic day.